Welcome to So Close to Homeless, a panel discussion wrapping up our series on homelessness in Southern Oregon. I'm Craig Small. And I'm Natalie Weber. For 24 straight weeks, NBC5 News and Access have shared dramatic stories from people who are homeless, have been homeless, or have had their lives shaped dramatically by it. This project is unlike anything we've done in our 64 years of broadcasting, six months of work. It's been an incredible project to work on, but it's all part of a community discussion that we've taken on with Access to bring a growing problem to light. Only on five tonight, we're in the 23rd week of So Close to Homeless, a community. This series <laughs> was the hardest thing that I have ever done. And it's not something that I necessarily set out to do. I was looking for a chance to be more involved in the community. I hadn't really done much work with the homeless population here. The stories that I had done were people who were causing disruptions in the park. It was the problem side of homelessness, so to speak. The things that, you know, people complain about in city council meetings. And so I wanted to see the other side. I realized that there were people who were living in their cars who didn't want to be known as homeless. You know, there's a stigma attached to that. And I wanted to see that other side. I wanted to meet these people and find out how do they do this every day? Starting out the series, a lot of these people didn't want to be recognized for this. But when you don't have that human contact, you sort of lose that human part of yourself. And when you are dealing with such a devastating reality every day and you lose that too, what do you have left? Throughout this series and especially toward the end, I've had a lot of people say, wow, you know, I've seen this. You should be really proud of this. It's so inspiring and, you know, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. And I never quite know what to say to that because as much as I have loved this series, I don't think it's my work that's been inspiring. What I see as inspiring are these 24 people who were able to say, this isn't okay, this is my life, it's really hard, and I don't know what I'm gonna do tomorrow. The fact that they kept pushing when they could have easily given up and said, this is, you know, this is my life, I live on this park bench. Well, they didn't take that, they didn't settle for that. They wanted their life back and most of them are back on their feet now. And that is what I think is inspiring. Since we started this project six months ago, a lot has changed. I think my views and opinions have changed a lot. I've learned a lot. I think the way we approach stories on homelessness has changed. I hope the way that the community looks at homelessness has changed. That was one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this. I wanted people to understand what homelessness is and being homeless isn't a bad thing. It's homelessness that's the problem. And if we can find a way to bridge the gap and do our part each and every day, even if it's smiling at someone on the street corner or waving to them or whatever, I think we can make a big difference in our community one day, one small gesture at a time. Natalie, thank you. I know having seen you go through the highs and lows of these 24 weeks, I know you mean every word. Absolutely. Well, let's turn now to meet our panelists. To my right, we have Mary Farrell, Executive Director of the Maslow Project, serving homeless youth and families. Happy to be here. And Peter Buckley, to my left, we have former state representative Peter Buckley, of course, as well as a program manager for Southern Oregon Success. Thanks, Greg. We have David Mulig, Director of Access Support Services. Thank you. Happy to be here. And Chief Chris Allison, Central Point Police Department. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, Lisa O'Connor, Executive Director of the Family Nurturing Center at Children's Relief Nursery. Thankful to be part of this discussion. 
Thank you all for participating today. We'll start with you, Chief Allison. So in your experiences with homelessness or people who are homeless, what consistent patterns do you see either in the cause of homelessness itself or the impacts of it? So I think that that is a two-part question. Um, I think that the causes of homelessness are, there, there's just a plethora of them. Um, it can be either dealing with people who are in crisis, whether that's from um, different types of substance abuse issues or mental health crisis. So you have a lot of different populations who are potentially homeless. Now, the um, how our experiences are with them are they are we don't have a lot of resources for them and it's really very difficult especially from a law enforcement community is to get people to where they need to be and keep them safe and our community safe I think a lot of people think that it's the the police's job really to solve this problem the people on the streets how, you, how do you approach that? So I think that, that that is true. I think that's the perception. Um, really at 11 p.m. when someone is experiencing someone who is in crisis potentially on the streets, they're calling us. And so how we look at it from the Central Point Police Department is we're the first open door for access for resources to get them help. Speaking of access, David, what do you think about consistent patterns uh, either in causes of homelessness or the impacts of being homeless. Yeah, some of the other things that I uh, experience when we're working with some of our, popu our homeless population uh, is it's, it's poverty. You know, we have many people in our community who either don't have a job or they don't have a job that pays well enough for them to be able to support having a home. So it could be sim something as simple as that. We know that in Jackson County that we have a, a low stock of affordable housing. So even if someone does have funding and can afford their housing, there's a difficult time to be able to find housing in our community. Uh, Chief Allison also mentioned something about uh, mental health and some challenges that you know, some of our community may have around mental health, but there's also alcohol and drug um, uh, uh, concerns that people may have for a variety of reasons. And so I think there's a, a many, many causes of homelessness. One of the things I think is really important, uh, and I think it's been said over the last 24 weeks, is that many people are just one paycheck away from being homeless. Um, and it could be our neighbor, it could be the person sitting across from us. And so uh, that's, you know, regardless of any of the other things that we just talked about, uh, just losing your job or not mm -hmm. having a paycheck or a health crisis can make a, a difference between being housed and homeless. When it comes to families, either of you can can speak on this. You know, what do you see? Do you see a lot of people who have lost their jobs, or is it a, def a bunch of different causes? For us, I would say uh, most of the time it's a generational thing. That unless somebody has been chronically homeless, typically there is you know trauma is passed down from generation to generation. So families that themselves struggle often find that in their future, in their children's future, and so I think. You, there's a stigma that you know everyone that is homeless chooses to be homeless, and I can tell you from a lot of our parents' perceptive perception, they do not choose it. It's it's um, it's impossible to do a bedtime routine when you're living in a tent. It's really difficult to get your children to school if you're living in a park somewhere. It's uh, stigmatizing to them, and I would say although that's not necessarily a cause. It causes them not to seek help when they are judged when they're seeking help, so. Yeah, I would agree. I think in the roughly thousand families that we work with every year, we see everything from domestic violence, mm -hmm. uh, where there was a good income in the household, steady, but domestic violence forced the mother to leave in the middle of the night with their children and they ended up on the streets. Um, we do see occasionally substance abuse or mental health but oftentimes it's you know that qualifying medical event that uh, they didn't have health insurance and so they're now filing bankruptcy and losing housing over something that um, many of us take for granted. Or they lost their job. We saw a lot of um, families who had never experienced housing or, or homelessness before it become homeless during the uh, economic downfall of you know the earlier part of this um, decade and they're still struggling to recover. They're still struggling to uh, stabilize after that and the impact of all that is like Lisa was saying if families don't have um, sort of their basic needs met it's really hard to think about 
you know, school and work and some of those higher level goals when you're just trying to stay alive, keep your children safe, get them to school in the first place, put food on, you know, the table for them or clothes on them. They don't know where their basic needs are coming from, so how do they start to think about, you know, uh, stabilizing housing? So, Mary, you bring up a great point, too, about the kind of downward spiral that is made worse by the kind of the timing of the recession okay. and then the recovery and affordable housing. The fact that there are families that have spiraled down, they're struggling just to do the basics, mm -hmm. and even when we can get them resources, and even when they start moving forward again, where can they go to afford stable housing? So that's that really kind of dynamic of timing that's really um, impacting a lot of families. Yeah, it's an excellent point, Peter. I was actually gonna, gonna ask, Mary, I wanna ask you, what consistent patterns do you see with people moving out of homelessness and into, as Peter said, sustainable housing? Yeah, that's a great question because oftentimes the prevailing theory is if you just provide a home, then that solves the problem. But in a situation um, where there might be some skill development that needs to happen. So how do you then maintain housing once you have it? Or if the issue is income, so there's a lot of programs out there that help get individuals housed, but if they can't sustain that housing, if they can't work, if they have disabilities, medical needs, uh, experiencing domestic violence, those kinds of things, it can get in the way of maintaining housing. So we see a lot of, um, we see a lot of families and individuals go through homelessness and them being stably housed and then become homeless again. Mm. And uh, it's, just, it's just providing services to them once they've been housed to ensure that they can develop the skills they need to maintain that housing, maintain employment, what have you. That's a critical part that's oftentimes missing. David, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would uh, totally agree with what Mary just said. Uh, we often, uh, many of the families that we work with are individuals, they already come to us with high mm -hmm. barriers. You know, they're, um, whether it's a lack of job, but they may have um, a criminal background or right. an eviction on their, you know, on their credit report. And so the first thing we want to do is to help support them and uh, working with a landlord to at least have the opportunity for a family to be housed. That doesn't mean those barriers go away. When you know, a family is housed, if there's not the support structures, you know, the support to helping find you know, additional or find uh, a higher income or a job, or if there are substance abuse um, challenges, if it's not supported once they're housed, then uh, they're gonna, you know, our families are at risk of, you know, receiving an eviction and then becoming homeless again. So I think that the barriers that our families and individuals are stepping into as they move into a home. Uh, if you know the need is to really address all of those as a community because we can't you know all of us doing you know services for our, our homeless population don't have the access to um, do that full supportive wraparound services mm -hmm. I was just going to say a lot of our families tell us that what happens for them is they look around one day they wake up everybody thinks they're doing okay and they're they wake up alone that many of our families don't have natural supports in place. They don't have family that they can call on or count on. And so many of us um, in the nonprofit community try to provide that for them, but it's not the same. And it really is a community issue because, uh, like David was saying, if somebody chooses not to rent to a family because they haven't had good rental history, that's one more barrier stacked against them, that that's a difficult thing to to just create all of a sudden unless somebody is willing to give them a chance. But oftentimes families are left without transition or when they do get a job, all of the supports that they've re received before, they're all of a sudden ineligible for. So they again find themselves without help oftentimes when they need it the most. Mm -hmm. And Peter, you brought up sustainable housing. Do you want to weigh in with Southern Oregon success and what you guys see? Certainly. I mean, it, uh, sustainable housing is coming up in every conversation across all sectors. Uh, our organization works with healthcare, education at all levels, public safety, workforce development, and in every one of those sectors there are people talking about the need for affordable housing in our region, and it's just not there. I mean, we have jobs that are going uh, unfilled, simply because we can't, people who are qualified who might want to come here, take those jobs, they can't find housing. It's a huge issue. The uh, one positive thing that I'm seeing is like the city of Grants Pass, for instance, is actually taking a very proactive approach and saying, what can we do to change our regulations? What can we do to, to let people add an accessory house? So, you know, a, a, you know uh, we used to call them a mother-in-law flat, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on your backyard. So mm -hmm. we can actually add housing and add housing stock. 
it's absolutely essential for us to all participate in that idea saying, how do we increase the stock of housing, increase access to housing, and then increase the stability once people have access to the housing. Mm -hmm. And, and Chief, I would imagine for you, you know, with, with your agency, the, you know, it's not wraparound services. You know, you right. guys are helping these people, but, but yeah. you're, you're not able to bring them through the process. Well, and, and kind of talking to Lisa's point is that you're exactly right. We're not, a wrap, we're not designed to be a wraparound service, but we are. You know, a lot of times when you talk about the ongoing services and those supports, these individuals, they don't have them. And so, again, because they have that open door or we've opened those doors for them, they come to us looking for more support. And then we try to get them either to Mary or to Lisa or to David's um, door. But if, um, if something isn't in place, then they come back to us so that we can reestablish any type of a relationship. So it is interesting with law enforcement how we have become a wraparound service, um, not necessarily by choice, but by necessity. If I can make a point there too, I think the K-12 people would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because uh, our educators say constantly, you know, we got in the business, we came here, we we're going to teach, mm -hmm. but they are now given the, or have the responsibility of even providing a kind of wraparound service or the idea of how do we take care of the kids and our families in our districts and make sure they're connected the way yeah. they need to be connected. I, I, think, I think so. I think you're seeing a lot of these different disciplines, whether it's educators, law enforcement, social services, where even though so social services is a wraparound support, um, much more so than we've ever imagined. All right, Chief, thank you so much. More the discussion continues after the break. Early in February, February 12th, and yep. March 15th. But a little bit, a little bit kind unexpected. Of took us by surprise. Yeah. There was no place I could bring my son home to, and so when he was born, I had to go, I had to do something. We had a double stroller with four kids and suitcases and like just whatever we had. There's a lot of stuff that comes available, but it seems like it's um, sometimes yes. overly priced. And um, yeah, much time there's about 20 other applicants also applying for something. That's if it's not a scam to begin with. We had actually a lot of help with housing. Um, St. Vincent de Paul, we had an outreach worker um, from Medford that would come to Ashland and help. They helped with some of our bills and rent. and. And then um, Maslow kind of got hooked in. The longer you hold out, the more you suffer. When you finally reach out for help or you finally give up is when you get saved. Every day, Access fights homelessness in Jackson County. Through a special SSVF grant, Access has been working with local landlords and property owners to house all of our veterans. So far, our community and its landlords have helped over 600 veterans and their families, but there's still more to do. If you're a landlord or property owner, even if your rental is currently occupied, Access would love to discuss this amazing program. Click on House Veterans Now at accesshelps.org to sign up. The 5 on 5 on NBC5. When the headlines come from Salem and Washington, we don't forget Southern Oregon. How does this affect the Rogue Valley? That's a great question. We make sure the politicians keep it local. There are active timber sales going on, and we can create jobs here. Because when they're in our studio, they answer to you. We've already had three town hall meetings. Last night, protesters greeted you at a private fundraiser in Medford. The 5 on 5 with NBC5 News Director Craig Smullen. Weeknights on NBC5 News at 5. What is an NBC5 News exclusive? It's uncovering the undisclosed document, getting the big interview, going to places others pass by. It's the news you'll hear days later from other stations. Exclusive means you're always the first to know. Don't you want to know first? Of course you do. Craig Smolin and Kristen Hosfeld, NBC5 News at 6. Uncovering more exclusive stories that happen every day in your place. 
NBC5 News is first to break the big stories you need to know about. Some Ashland students are forced to stay home after two cases of a whooping cough are confirmed in the district. NBC5 first told you about the outbreak last night, and now Jackson County is requiring all exposed children who have not been vaccinated to stay home from school for at least three weeks. Those three weeks are how long someone with whooping cough can be infectious. NBC5 News and KOBI5.com, your place to see the big stories first. Welcome back to our panel discussion wrapping up our 24 weeks so close to homeless series brought to you by NBC5 News and Access. Already our panel of experts have talked about their firsthand experiences, the causes and impacts of homelessness and how some people have found a path towards stable housing. Now let's learn about some incredible research. It's called ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation, 
and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. Well, Peter, this is a fascinating study and one I know you're very familiar with. So much to focus in on. What stands out to you most about the science of resilience? Well, first of all, the, the ACEs study itself, the most important public health study of its kind ever done in our country, it gives us these kind of pathways to root causes of things like homelessness, things like addiction, the things that we're struggling with as a society and as families, as communities. And resilience is the science that basically asks the question of why. Why does one person who experiences adversity not end up homeless or not end up struggling with addiction. Another person who experiences the exact same sort of adversity ends up homeless or experiencing poverty, etc. And resilience is actually the study of what happens in uh, a person's life. And the exciting part about resilience is that it's something we can all participate in. There's like three core protective systems in resilience. The first is individual capabilities, working on people's individual skills and capabilities. The second is belonging and attachment. It's really, uh, do we have people in our life that, that we can actually trust? And can we build those relationships? And the third part is community. The third part is actually intentionally building a community, really focusing on building a community that supports children and families. And this has been done around the country to great success. The state of Washington is about 12 years in front of us on this. The Self-Healing Communities Initiative in the state of Washington. Incredible results, things like teen suicide rates going down by 98%, drug and alcohol abuse going down, graduation rates going up. So the study of resilience paired with the science behind the ACEs study gives a very powerful path to follow. So you would say that personal relationships do make a difference? They're absolutely essential. All, all the resilience literature shows that even one positive, healthy relationship with an adult in a child's life. It can be a coach, it can be a teacher, it can be a neighbor, it can be an aunt and uncle. Even one caring and competent adult in a kid's life is a linchpin for resilience. If there's two, the odds go up. If there's three or more, the odds skyrocket. Chief Allison, I know you guys are really involved in the community with Central Point Police. Do you have officers who take on this role for some people? We do. We have I will say all of our officers take on that, this role to some extent. Uh, one that I'd like to highlight is the school resource program. I will tell you we have officers in all of our schools um, from day to day and if I talk with a child or an adult later on, 18 years or older, they won't know who the chief, who the lieutenants, who the sergeants are, but they'll tell me who their school resource officer was um, many, many years down um, the road. It, it's a invaluable process um, to have those officers making those connections early on and it's something that um, we really support and we see the results. We really see them um, day after day when someone's coming later on in life saying, I need your help, which is what we're here to do. Absolutely. And Mary, working with kids, I can only I can only imagine that that much more important relationships. Absolutely. In fact, we've realized over the last few years that it's the single biggest indicator for our children that we work with, whether or not they stay in school, whether or not they um, stabilize, is the number of positive relationships that they're, they have in their life, and that's actually the number one outcome we measure. Hmm. Is do they have two or more positive relationships in their life, whether it's school, school resource officer, um, a counselor, a coach, anybody, and that's part of what we do is help foster those relationships. Lisa, I see you nodding. Do you agree? Do you think we're on the same page? It's the premise of all of our work. I mean, you know, we are social creatures by nature. And I was just, you know, I was reflecting that oftentimes, you know, when a baby is first born, even the parent's brain will grow for the first six months in their emotional center and in their logical center. But for families that are under a lot of duress and a lot of stress, their brain might not grow. And so a lot of what we work on is attachment and bonding and the importance of that and what that means to both the child and to the parent in the future. And so that's just a, 
it's one of those statistics that I hate. That. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, you also have parent mentors in, in, in the, yes. with your work, which I think is fascinating. The fact that someone who has gone through life mm -hmm. experience and then is able to kind of translate what they've gone through to the next generation and really help a young mom who might be struggling. I think that's a fantastic thing. They have this innate desire to pay it forward. They, uh, almost all of our families, that is the one thing that I think that the community isn't aware of, that folks that are helped are more likely to help someone else, and we see communities of parents helping one another. There's nothing more degrading in one hand for a family to come in and to utilize our clothing closet, but you see a very different experience or a very different look on their face when they come back to recycle those clothes to pay it forward to the next mm -hmm. person. Nice. So I think that those are things that we just need to not lose sight of. Mary, how do you think we can do a better job of nurturing those types of relationships? <laughs> Well, I think just um, acknowledging that that for some individuals they they may need help um, feeling safe to be vulnerable enough to form a relationship, and that safety comes from not being judged, and not having to deal with the stigma that comes along with being homeless, not have to, having to feel like people are making assumptions about why you're in your situation. That allows them to sort of let their guard down and be open to a relationship, whether it's you know a teacher or. Or um, we have a lot of our students that actually their school resource officer is the person that they trust. Um, a lot of our kids would say that Maslow is their family, and the hardest thing for them is to become stable and not not qualify for our services anymore. It's sort of like how do you not qualify for your family? Um, that's not a real thing. And so you know, how do you allow those relationships to grow naturally? How do you help them um, secure those relationships and then maintain them over time? David, what do you think about relationships? Yeah, um, I think it's a one thing that I definitely want to get out um, to, for people to know, and I think everyone would agree, is uh, oftentimes when we see individuals and families coming in, I'm amazed by their resiliency already, walking in the door. Um, their, the need and the desire to want to do something and to move forward. Um, so I want to acknowledge the resiliency that a lot of uh, people coming for help already have. Uh, we at Access, oftentimes, uh, the individuals that we hire to do the work may have similar stories, um, especially in our veteran program. We like to make sure we hire some veterans who might have experienced homelessness themselves, and so they can actually be a peer mentor mm -hmm. as well as a, a case manager or, or a support specialist who can then work with them on skill building and you know, bring you know that camaraderie and that sense of uh, I've been there and here's what helped me. What's going to help you? And uh, you know, really have that support. And so, um, bringing in whatever the resiliency they have. Oftentimes, I think the workers. I mean, you know, the students, um, the peer, you know, the parent peers, uh, the caseworkers that access. Those are, um, or may be that person who holds that space for them to grab onto the light as they work through what they need to work through mm -hmm. to be successfully housed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a really um, wonderful, uh, it, you know, what people, the strength that people have that want to get out of uh, the situation um, really comes through when they have someone there who's going to sit with them, hear their story, um, and then uh, really work with them, listen, and figure out a way to help them out. Excellent points. Thank you all. We'll be right back. Half my caseload is with veterans. Very uh, traumatic uh, things happened to me in the, in the military. I was never really homeless until 1999 when uh, I was, I got into uh, drugs pretty bad and I ended up in trouble with the law because of that, and then uh, it just spiraled out of control from there. It was a lot of hard work to be able to get to where the two of us are at today. A lot of them want to work, they want to be housed, they want to be productive members of society. It's hard, where do you st when you're out on the street, how do you start? There are a lot of resources out there to help, as long as you're wanting the help, but you have to have the willingness to accept that help, or you won't get anywhere. Every day, Access fights homelessness in Jackson County. 
Through a special SSVF grant, Access has been working with local landlords and property owners to house all of our veterans. So far, our community and its landlords have helped over 600 veterans and their families, but there's still more to do. If you're a landlord or property owner, even if your rental is currently occupied, Access would love to discuss this amazing program. Click on House Veterans Now at accesshelps.org to sign up. The 5 on 5 on NBC5. When the headlines come from Salem and Washington, we don't forget Southern Oregon. How does this affect the Rogue Valley? That's a great question. We make sure the politicians keep it local. There are active timber sales going on, and we can create jobs here. Because when they're in our studio, they answer to you. We've already had three town hall meetings. Last night, protesters greeted you at a private fundraiser in Medford. The 5 on 5 with NBC5 News Director Craig Smolin. Weeknights on NBC5 News at 5. What is an NBC5 News exclusive? It's uncovering the undisclosed document, getting the big interview, going to places others pass by. It's the news you'll hear days later from other stations. Exclusive means you're always the first to know. Don't you want to know first? Of course you do. Craig Smolin and Kristen Hosfeld, NBC5 News at 6. Uncovering more exclusive stories that happen every day in your place. Welcome back to our So Close to Homeless panel discussion, wrapping up our 24-week series brought to you by NBC5 News and Access. Our panelists work with the homeless in a variety of different ways, from law enforcement to keeping kids safe and in school. Well, let's get our panel discussion going again. Uh, Chief Allison, I want to ask you, what have you learned about homelessness that you wish everyone knew? So that's such an insightful question because one of the things that I take away every day from my work when I was um, able to have the day-to-day -day contact with people who were struggling with homelessness was how much they brought to my life, how much I felt and took away from just interacting with these people who are so strong, who are dealing with their families, who are dealing with crisis. And I wish everyone could see some of these stories and opportunities I've had because of um, my work with them, um, because it's been really insightful. And um, I, I think sometimes it's lost. Yeah, and I, I want to go along um, with what Chief Allison said. One of the pieces I think has been really important about these last 24 weeks um, for me personally is we've had, we have so many stereotypes in our uh, culture about who is homeless and, 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 you know, and there's such a negative connotation to mm -hmm. you know, with this idea of who you are, who they are. And what I'm hearing Chris, um, Chris Allison, Chief Allison stating right now, and it's my experience, is that for every individual that we see that's visual to us that's homeless, there are countless stories that we never hear. Mm -hmm. Countless stories we never hear. And so, you, you know, you're experiencing them, you have stories. Mm -hmm. You know, Natalie, you've discovered stories. We hear stories all the time that are not made public. They're not, you know, our community doesn't know about them. Uh, so I just really appreciate the story because I think that that's what we're doing. We're getting the story out. And that's what I've personally been amazed um, in learning in my own growth about, you know, who our homeless population is, not only in my work, but in the work mm -hmm. that we've done the last 24 weeks. You know, there's been a talk in the people who work at the ACEs, uh, the science behind ACEs, there's a kind of saying that people use that people who can do well, do well. And if someone's not doing well, there's a reason that they're not doing well. And as a society and as a community or as a family or as an educator, it's kind of our responsibility to figure out, okay, why is it that you're not doing well and what can we do to address it? And that really kind of goes down to the root of it. it we adapt to what, to what we experience. So if someone is adapted by using drugs and alcohol as an adaptation to their experience, then how can we help them adapt in a different way? How can we help them get those skills? Skills have been brought up several times the idea of what are the skills that are lacking for an individual, for a family, for a community. How can we work on that mm -hmm. and consciously put those skills in place so people can access them? Yeah, and just to kind of go on with that a little bit further is, you know, we may just think that someone who is a, using alcohol and drugs, you know, or have a challenge or a difficulty, but someone experiencing alcohol, alcohol and drug uh, challenges, they're actually very skillful. skillful. You know, they've learned they've how to adapt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think what I'm hearing you say is that the important thing is for us as providers is 
How do we take that skill that they have you know, learned and move it into a different way that's going to be a potentially a different, more positive way in their life? You know, so you know, these negative stereotypes or connotations, they, they, people learn. They actually have skills that can be brought and um, you know, acknowledged and actually used to go forward. I'd like to speak to that just briefly because while that is certainly happening in certain cases, I think it's really important just to point out that the majority of the individuals that we work with, again, that's over you know, 2,400 individuals in a year, are not experiencing drug or alcohol use at all. And I definitely think that we have a high number of, of people who, through no fault of their own or through no action that they took that society deems sort of negative behaviors, ended up homelessness. And I believe most of our community would not imagine that a, a mother who checks into the hospital and gives birth to a brand new newborn, uh, that that could possibly turn out three days later to a mother camping outside with yeah. a newborn baby. Most people don't think that that's happening, that certainly our community wouldn't allow such a thing. But it does happen. It happens all the time. And certainly that infant mm -hmm. has nothing to do with how it ended up in a mm -hmm. homeless mm -hmm. situation. And, so I just like to be really careful that we don't overstate um, drug and alcohol use or mental illness or, or other factors as being why people are homeless because most people are very close to it themselves or they know someone, a friend, a neighbor, a relative who is either experiencing some form of homelessness, whether it's couch surfing doubled up with another family or is one paycheck away. Absolutely. Mary, maybe yeah. this might be old manism on my part, but uh, when I grew up, we didn't seem to have a tremendous homeless problem like, like we right. do now. And I think part of that was because we did have, we had strong family connections. People didn't travel and, you know, disperse off so often. And we had more of a social network that we grew. So trying to grow that social network back, trying to grow, grow that community back is a way, I mean, you just told me that story about the little baby being homeless three days. I didn't know that. That scares me uh, right. tremendously. And that, that calls us to action of some sort. As a community, I think we can do better. And I think just to play off that, we get a lot of older individuals who come in, what can I do to help? I was experiencing homelessness when I was a teenager or when I was in school, and nobody knew. And wow. I think part of it is not that there was less homelessness when you might have been younger. Uh, I do think you're right that people stay closer to their families, but the reality is um, it's only been in modern times that we are trying to break down that stigma and say, well, there's help and we're not shaming you for being homeless. So I think we know about it more. I just mm -hmm. think that people feel more comfortable saying, I'm in this situation and not fearing uh, some sort of negative consequence. So I think there's more spotlight on homelessness than there has been in the past, but I think there's always been couch surfing youth. Since right. mm -hmm early time. David, yeah. if you were to describe a community that truly addresses the root cause of homelessness and provides opportunities for everyone, what would that look like? Well, that's a really it's huge a big question. <laughs> <It's a big laughs> question. <laughs> Thank goodness we have a panel here to help answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I do think that there's many things we can do, and I think you know this conversation that we're having here is a really great start to get this what we're already doing into the community um, for sure. One of the things that I think is a, it's vitally important as we talk about our community coming together and understanding um, the, the true faces of homelessness and why someone finds themselves homeless is that it's not just our job. The, you know, those of us sitting around in this, in this panel or those of us that are working with individuals in poverty, um, it's all of our job. It's the entire community. Uh, our, our homeless is our, you know, they're our neighbors. You know, so we need our, our medical field. We need our businesses. We need our um, our government. We need everyone to come together to look at some of the root causes. I think the root causes are are known. It's been, you know, we have data around what the root causes are. So it's not to reinvent the causes. It is who are, do we need around the table? What voices are missing to look at the root causes and say, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm committed to do as a business leader, as someone who's in government, as someone who runs a hospital, for instance. David, what I think that what we can play into this also is building those relationships. So we've talked about one type of a relationship, but it's also about community partners building these relationships of all of us together and the hospitals, the um, business community, making these relationships and center it around these problems mm -hmm. that we could all get together, talk, and see if we can try to brainstorm and um, bring this to the forefront instead of always putting it in the back. Yeah, and I, do you mind if I just jump in? 
one thing, you know, and, and talking about, you know, the big picture, having businesses and, you know, law enforcement. But I think one of the things that's also important, is, um, what can we do individually? You know, so I'm not, I don't run a business, you know, and I, I'm not running for political office, you know, whatever. You know, but it's also, when, I, when we talk about community, again, we're talking about the people who live next door to us or someone who's in the line in front of us at the, you know, checking out, you know, that may feel shame or embarrassed because they're using a particular car that might, you know, come along with judgment. You know, so it's what can we do individually as well as what can we do as a, a community that actually has resources. Um, and that's the question to pose you know, in this conversation is, you know, who is this, who are we, and what are we willing to bring to this conversation and, and make a difference together? Well, Mary touched on something earlier on, which talked about the, the idea of safety or people feeling safe, and that's something each one of us can do all the time. You mentioned somebody in a grocery store who might feel awkward. Can you help that, that person in a grocery store feel safer, more mm -hmm. comfortable, more relaxed, less stressed out? Mm -hmm. We can do that with our school kids, too, we, 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 and we're, we're making that effort. Just having uh, people who work on school campuses look kids in the eye and call them by name. Mm -hmm. Developing that intentional creation of community over and over again. That's what builds resilience, that's what builds a resilient community. Intentional looking at the people who you live with and you work with and mm -hmm. saying, what can I do to help build this, to help move this forward? Yeah, and that's one of the things when you and I have talked about the ACES study, and uh, I think you said in Phoenix in the schools, there, there's a game. You know, right. they're, they're practicing where right. the teachers are deliberately looking at students three times a day. Yeah. And it has proven to make that connection, which then helps build resiliency. And so the, the uh, opportunity that we have as a community, um, the littlest thing we can do is when we walk by uh, someone who may be sitting in front of Fred Meyer who looks a certain way, if we stop and look them in the eye, one, that can be good enough. If we want to say hi, that's good enough. You know? And so if I do it, who knows, maybe five minutes later you're going to do it. You know, and then a half a day later, Barry's going to do it. And so now this individual has had three contacts. Mm -hmm. And so following that same idea, you know, it's kind of playing a game. Yeah, you know, that we're, you know, if we all did something as simple as that, we can start making movement and creating a self-healing and, 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 and uh, a community with, of empathy. I think what you're talking about, David, is just meeting individuals where they're at in life on that day. Yeah. So whatever level of crisis they might be in, whatever level of readiness to take the next step they might be at, that's where you start and you just go from there. All right, thank you so much. Stay with us, we'll be right back. I had been living on savings, but they were gone. After a time, people started going, well, you know, we love you, but you gotta go. <laughs> you know. I'm thinking now that I'm 61 years old, I'm not an asset to nobody anymore. You know, and it's really starting to bug me. Can't seem to find a job. I got like 26, 28 applications out. When you're working and you're making big money and things are working good, you tend to forget, I guess. I did anyway. They, they think homeless shelter and they go, how can I be in a homeless shelter? I knew that was not a good place. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. Every day, Access fights homelessness in Jackson County. Through a special SSVF grant, Access has been working with local landlords and property owners to house all of our veterans. So far, our community and its landlords have helped over 600 veterans and their families, but there's still more to do. If you're a landlord or property owner, even if your rental is currently occupied, Access would love to discuss this amazing program. Click on House Veterans Now at accesshelps.org to sign up. The 5 on 5 on NBC5. When the headlines come from Salem and Washington, we don't forget Southern Oregon. How does this affect the Rogue Valley? That's a great question. We make sure the politicians keep it local. There are active timber sales going on, and we can create jobs here. Because when they're in our studio, they answer to you. We've already had three town hall meetings. Last night, protesters greeted you at a private fundraiser in Medford. The 5 on 5 with NBC5 News Director Craig Smolin. Weeknights on NBC5 News at 5. 
NBC5 News is first to break the big stories you need to know about. Some Ashland students are forced to stay home after two cases of whooping cough are confirmed in the district. NBC5 first told you about the outbreak last night, and now Jackson County is requiring all exposed children who have not been vaccinated to stay home from school for at least three weeks. Those three weeks are how long someone with whooping cough can be infectious. NBC5 News and KOBI5.com, your place to see the big stories first. Hello, my schedule unfortunately doesn't let me attend in person, but I wanted to start by giving a huge thanks to the whole KOBI team and Access. Natalie's 24-week series examining homelessness in Southern Oregon shines a much needed spotlight on the real life heartbreak behind the troubling facts and figures in our state and nationwide. Simply put, we see far too many instances of kids and vets and families and Oregonians without a roof over their heads and scrambling for their next meal. We know there isn't just one factor that's causing so much homelessness, but it's becoming clear to me that our country's federal housing policy deeply needs a remodel. So here's what I'm working on that can help. I'm fighting to expand the low income housing tax credit. Over the past three decades, this credit has provided affordable housing to more than 85,000 households in our state. And I've introduced a bill that provides a tax credit to developers to build affordable housing for middle income families who are increasingly pinched by soaring rents. That's essential at a time when nearly 30% of middle income renters in Oregon pay over more than 30% of their income to keep a roof over their head. And last year, as I worked to secure $320 million for the Supportive Services Program for Vets Families and $496 million for Vets uh, Supportive Housing Vouchers, these programs have made a real difference, as so many of you know, in helping veterans and their families find homes. So let me close with another thanks to Natalie, the KOBI team, and all in Southern Oregon who are really pushing to drive more attention to the problem of homelessness. You've highlighted resources that are out in the community, like Access and UCAN, the VA, the Family Nurturing Center, the Salvation Army, and others. So now what we're going to try to do is make sure that the federal government is a better partner for all of you who are doing this good work in the community. And I look forward to staying in touch with you in the days ahead as we try to build the strongest possible community-driven coalition with all your incredible folks, making sure that there are more opportunities to deal with the extraordinary challenge of homelessness that Natalie has now documented for the public record. Senator Wyden, thank you so much. It's great to hear that work is being done about this terrible problem. Well, we've only got a few minutes left, and I do want the panel to focus now on what our viewers can, can do about this problem. Mary, what sort of action can people take today to help those that are homeless? Well, sometimes what people don't do is as important as what they do do. So don't be judgmental, don't make assumptions, don't stereotype homeless individuals. Um, don't assume that someone else is taking care of this issue. Uh, do express empathy, do have compassion, do ask what you can do to help, whether it's of a local church that you're affiliated with, a, a nonprofit, um, your community. That's my best advice. That's great. <laughs> Bullet points and a quick take home. That's exactly what we're talking about. Anybody else want to chime in with those? I also want to talk with um, talk what, to what Mary said about having compassion and empathy. It's it's really important. And then also from a law enforcement standpoint, you know, we are an open door. We are someone who can get people into resources. We can connect the people with nonprofits, we can be that connection point. And I think sometimes we're not looked at um, a organization that does that, but I think from our standpoint, 
point, I think sometimes we're the first um, open door that we can do that. So call, call the police. That's what we're here for. Right? That's what we want to do. So I would echo to do everything you can on a personal level, like, like Mary suggested. If you want to become more involved, uh, Southern Oregon Success and the groups that we're working with with the Self-Healing Communities Initiative, using the Science Family ACEs study, uh, and we're trying to intentionally build our community by bringing forward tools for resilience that people can actually use uh, on their individual level, the family level, their organization level, and their, uh, their entire community level. And uh, we'll be having events throughout the fall. There's really a lot of momentum uh, growing. We've trained over 6,000 people in Jackson and Josephine County with the information about ACEs and resilience. And that's starting to come together. We're going to have events throughout November. It's going to be Trauma-Informed Care Awareness Month in November. La Clinica is going to participate, Rural Community Health, all the various organizations, the school districts, these wraparound services we're talking about. We're capable of putting this together and addressing this issue and having much greater impact they've had this far. Yeah, and I just want to jump in. <clears throat> Black and white, if somebody has resources, write a check to an organization that you really want to support. Um, right yes. there, you know, that's one way you can help all of us or those that are helping uh, our community. Um, secondly, if uh, uh, one of the things that we could also ask our landlords, uh, I don't know, I mean, we talked about the, the lack of affordable housing. Um, this is a call out to our landlords. I mean, you're, you're hearing people, all of us here, talking about what we want to do and the support. So if you're a landlord and you're willing to work with us, give us a call. We need you. We need to be able to find the homes for our, our, our homeless families and our uh, uh, individuals. Personally, you know, what I think is really important um, for those of us that may not have the ability to write large checks or do something along those nature um, is to go back to a little bit of the ACEs studies and recognize that we all bring a story. You know, we've all experienced some level of trauma. I mean, maybe we don't use that word or not. And so if, if, if each of us just changed our perspective a little bit, and when we look at the other and not say what happened to you or what's wrong with you, but ask the question, how are we alike? That, sh that shifts the focus. That shifts the focus no matter what. How are we alike um, rather than what happened, what's wrong with you? Um, I think that's a beautiful point. And I'll just say that uh, a lot of our staff, their number one thing that they use with families is that we say sometimes you just need somebody to believe in you until you can believe in yourself. And that one act sounds really difficult, but it is, it's life changing for people. Back to connections and back to actually impacting someone's life. If you care enough to do something, care enough to look at someone, care enough to, to believe in them. Because there's a lot of lost human potential if we don't look at people for what their abilities are. For our organizations, are there uh, volunteer opportunities available? Absolutely. We work really hard to try to get families on a new trajectory, and so anybody who has skills in budgeting, financial literacy, uh, trade, it would be great to find apprenticeships for our families to learn a trade so that they're not getting a minimum wage job, that they're getting a living wage job. There's all kinds of opportunities for people to get involved. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to be here today and join us for this discussion. It's been a fitting end to a series that's been a great deal to both NBC5 and Access and to everyone. That's right, and I'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for watching this forum and for any efforts you take to help our homeless. Remember, if you or someone you know is struggling with homelessness, there are resources available. To learn more, check out SoCloseToHomeless.org and like SoCloseToHomeless on Facebook for updates. Have a great evening.